So welcome back. So we have shown that gamma of a half is equal to the value of the famous Gaussian integral, which is the square root of pi. But I was just going to remind you of the argument as to why the Gaussian integral comes out as the square root of pi, because it's such a wonderful argument. So the way that a genius figured out how to do this is that they actually considered what looks like a more complicated problem. So they went up into the bivariate world, the multivariable calculus world, and considered the function e to the negative x squared plus y squared, which is kind of like a bell-shaped surface, a bivariate version of the Gaussian function. And they thought about how would you integrate that over the entirety of the R2 plane. So find the volume of that, or the volume underneath that, bell-shaped surface over the entirety of the R2 plane. Now, why does that help? Well, let's call the value of this integral that we're trying to find i, just for integral. So this is some value that we're trying to ascertain. And now let's think about this problem. What we can do is split this into e to the negative x squared times e to the negative y squared. And then we can do the inner integration first, which we're integrating with respect to x first, so the e to the negative y squared bit, that doesn't play any role in the integration with respect to x, so that can be pulled out, which is what I've done here. So we've got the integral from negative infinity to infinity, e to the negative y squared, and then we've got the inner integral, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx, and then uh, dy, the outer integral. Now, this is obviously the value that we're trying to find. So we can now replace that with i. i is then a constant, so we can pull it out of the outer integral. So we'll get that this is i times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative y squared dy, which again is just i. So this comes out as i squared. So this thing, this bivariate equivalent of this problem, is going to come out as i squared. So if we could find out what this is, then we could just square root that answer, and then we'd get what this is. And amazingly, it's actually easier to perform this integration in the bivariate world, because what we can now do is change coordinates. We can change to polar coordinates, and integrating this in polar coordinates is amazingly actually easy. So transforming this integral into polar coordinates then, we still want to integrate over the entirety of the plane. So we need to integrate from 0 to 2 pi, and then we need to integrate r from 0 to infinity. And now the function in polar coordinates is just e to the negative r squared, because x squared plus y squared is r squared. And now instead of just having dr d theta here, remember when you integrate with respect to polar coordinates, you need r dr d theta. And that's the saviour here, that r because now this thing is easy to integrate. e to the negative r squared is not easy to integrate at all. Finding an antiderivative for that is not easy to do. Um, but when you have r e to the negative r squared, that we can find an antiderivative for, and therefore we can use the second fundamental theorem of calculus to uh, evaluate this integral. So in particular, if you think about what the derivative of e to the negative r squared is, so it'll be e to the negative r squared times the derivative of minus r squared, which is minus 2r. So it'll come out as minus 2r e to the negative r squared. So if we therefore took minus a half of this and considered what its derivative is, we'd get r e to the negative r squared, which is this thing. Therefore, this thing's antiderivative is minus a half e to the negative r squared. So we can therefore use the second fundamental theorem of calculus to now work out this integral. So performing the inner integral then, uh, we get the outer integral is still here, so the integral from 0 to 2 pi, and then the antiderivative of this is minus a half e to the negative r squared. We need to evaluate that between the limit 0 and infinity, and then integrate d theta. So evaluating this at the two limits then, if you consider the limit of this as, you, as r approaches infinity, e to the negative r squared is going to go to 0 as r goes to infinity. So that's going to go to zero. So we're then going to get minus what it is at the lower limit. So we'll get minus minus, which will cancel. So we'll get a half e to the negative zero squared. e to the negative zero squared is one. So we'll just get a half. So this whole thing comes out as a half. So it's going to be the integral from zero to two pi of a half d theta. So then do this final very simple integral. This um, will come out as a half theta 
evaluate this at the limit 0 to 2 pi, so upper limit will get 2 pi here, and then minus 0, so it will come out as 2 pi here, times a half, so overall we'll get that this integral is equal to pi. And remember, what we demonstrated here is that this integral, which is the same as this integral, is i squared, so therefore we can conclude that i, the initial integral we were after, this Gaussian integral, is the square root of pi. And hence, since we've shown that this Gaussian integral is the same thing as gamma of a half, we now know that gamma of a half is the square root of pi. So coming back then to what we were actually discussing, all of that was just a sidetrack to show that gamma of a half is equal to the square root of pi. So my point was that this PDF is the same as the PDF of gamma a half a half. So we've already verified that this matches this, we've verified that this matches this, we've verified that this bit, a half to the power of a half, gives you the square root of 1 over the square root of 2 here. We wanted this square root of pi, 1 over the square root of pi here, but we've got 1 over gamma of a half. Gamma of a half we now know is equal to the square root of pi, so indeed we do get that 1 over the square root of pi. So this PDF here that we've got on the positive real numbers is indeed the same as the PDF of the gamma distribution, a half a half. So chi squared with one degree of freedom is the same as the gamma distribution, half a half. So we've done that first simple case, we've shown that the chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom is the same as the gamma distribution a half a half, and that actually agrees with our general formula here. So if you put in n is equal to 1, you get gamma a half a half, so that's good. So let's now try to go to the general case with n degrees of freedom and show that this is the correct formula, gamma n over 2 a half. So what we know now is that each one of these things, x1 squared, x2 squared, all the way up to xn squared, they are all going to be distributed gamma a half a half, because each one of those is independent, normal naught 1. So if you consider x1 squared, it's normal naught 1, x1, so its square is going to be distributed gamma a half a half. If you go to x2, it's the exact same argument, it's also normal naught 1, so its square is going to be distributed gamma a half a half and so on, all the way up to xn, it's distributed normal naught 1, so its square is going to be distributed gamma a half a half. And all of these things, we're now going to think of each one of these as being a random variable now. We could relabel this up if you wanted. We could label it up as y1 is equal to x1 squared, where y1 is distributed gamma a half a half, and so on for all of them. So yi is equal to xi squared, and yi is distributed gamma a half a half. And now we're considering what the sum of these is, and we know that they're all distributed gamma a half a half, and we know they're all independent. So what x1 squared is does not affect what x2 squared is, and so on. So they're all independent. So we are effectively taking a bunch of or n random variables that are distributed gamma a half a half and adding them together and they're independent. Now we're going to use a fact about gamma distributions that if you remember brilliant, if you don't remember I will go through the argument as to why this is true in just a moment, but I'm firstly just going to state what this fact is. If you have two gamma random variables, so x and y, and x is distributed gamma alpha 1 beta, and y is distributed gamma alpha 2 beta. So the important thing is they have the same beta parameter. So if you have two random variables that have the same beta parameter, and you then consider adding them together to make a third random variable, then that thing will end up gamma distributed alpha 1 plus alpha 2 beta. So you just add the two alpha parameters together and you keep the same beta parameter. This is a fact about gamma distributions. You need to have the same beta parameter for this amazing, beautiful addition rule to work in this way. Now note, all of these do have the same beta parameter. So if I consider what x1 squared plus x2 squared is, they are both gamma a half half, they have the same beta parameter, so they're therefore going to be distributed gamma a half plus a half, a half. So it will come out as gamma one a half, this first bit. And then I can add this onto x3 squared, because still both of them have the same beta parameter, this sum of x1 squared plus x2 squared still has the beta parameter half, and this x3 squared will have the beta parameter half. So you can apply this recursively, and you can see that what you're overall going to end up with is just 
this sum is going to end up gamma distributed with all of the alphas added together and then this constant beta that has remained. So when you add all those halves together, all those alphas from these together, you'll get n times a half. Therefore, that's why you get n over 2 here. I've just written some of that down to make it clearer. So if we firstly consider what x1 squared plus x2 squared is, by this rule, we can that is going to be distributed gamma, and you just add the two alphas together, they've both got alpha parameter a half, so a half plus a half, and you keep the same beta parameter. So it'll be gamma 1, a half. Then what we can do is we can add this thing that we've already constructed here to x3 squared, because x3 squared has beta parameter a half, and x1 squared plus x2 squared has beta parameter a half. So if we add them together, they'll be gamma distributed, and then we add the alphas, so this one had alpha 1, and x3 squared has alpha a half, so it'll be 1 plus a half, and then you keep the same beta parameter, so you'll get 3 over 2, a half, and then you can continue this on recursively. We can now add x4 squared onto this thing, because they both have the same beta parameters. And you can see overall that if you add n of them together, you'll just end up adding all the alpha parameters together, which are all a half, so you'll get n of those, n over 2 overall, uh, and keeping the same beta parameter, which is a half. So it all hinges on this theorem then, which I will remind you of the argument as to why this is true. So this argument uses moment generating functions. So let's consider the moment generating function of the sum of these two random variables, x plus y. So I'm denoting that moment generating function of this random variable, which is x plus y, as a function of t. So by definition, this is the expected value of e to the t x plus y. Now, because of independence, you can split this up. Well, firstly, you can split this up into e to the tx times e to the ty inside here. But then because of independence, you can split this into the expected value of e to the tx times e to the ty. So that's using the independence of x and y. So it's extremely important then that all of these, the x1 squared, the x2 squared, all the way up to the xn squared, are all independent. And then this is the moment generating function of x, and this by definition is the moment generating function of y. So I've written down here just a little bit of an explanation as to why independence implies that you can split this in this way. So if you were to write out the definition of what this means, we need to integrate this, the law of the unconscious statistician tells us that we just need to integrate the joint PDF of x and y times e to the tx plus y, i.e. we just integrate what we've got here uh, times by the PDF over the entire domain of interest where this PDF is relevant. So I haven't put what domain this is, but over the entire range space uh, where this PDF, this joint PDF is relevant. But if x and y are independent, then the PDF can be split into the product of the two marginal PDFs. So the marginal PDF of x and the marginal PDF of y. And therefore, you can split this integration now. So we'll firstly do the inner integral. So I've also split up this into e to the tx times e to the ty. So now what we can do is we can pull out or everything in y out of the inner integral like so. So we've got the outer integral over whatever domain is relevant, fy e to the ty, and then we've got the inner integral, fx e to the tx dx. But then this thing is going to come out as the moment generating function of uh, x, and then that can then be pulled out of the outer integral. So you'll then have the outer integral, which will come out as the moment generating function of y. So that's why independence implies that the moment generating function of the sum of these two independent random variables is just the product of their two moment generating functions. So now what we need to do is think about what the moment generating function for a gamma random variable is going to be.